what has been really good about the campaign to bring awareness to child sexual abuse in the entire region has been the use of audiovisual uh, media. We already saw two videos prepared by Dr. Jones and the University of Huddersfield, as well as the Nun in Three uh, project. And we also saw one video that came out of the UWI St. Augustine IGDS BTS project. So now we are so pleased uh, that we're going to see something, an ad, a helpline ad from the Sweetwater Foundation, which allows us to understand and know a bit more about what is happening in Grenada. <laughs> How can I help? I don't have anyone I can talk to. Uh, I don't know what to do. Don't worry, sir. This call is confidential. Yes, girls. Like, really young girls. Uh, I can't stop thinking about them. Don't worry, sir. We will get you the help that you need. My mom won't believe me, but when she's on night shifts, my uncle keeps visiting me. I can't stop him. Don't worry, miss. We will make sure you never have to deal with this again. Wow, so short and yet so powerful. This now leads us into our feature speaker, the main activity of our session today. And we have Jonathan Bagan and Adele Jones, who will briefly introduce our guest speaker, who will then speak uh, directly without any more intervention on my part. So Jonathan Bagan and Adele Jones. Thank you, Dr. Radept. Hi, everybody. My name is Jonathan Bagan. I'm an attorney, and I also co-founded the so-called the Operation Global Sex Offenders Registry. It's a partnership with Offender Watch, a sex offender registry, registry software company. So to introduce Dr. Hazel Dabro is a huge and immense honor on my part. Dr. Dabro is a psychotherapist and child protection specialist and she specializes in treatments for both victims and perpetrators of child sexual abuse, intimate partner violence. And she is the founder and director of the Sweetwater Foundation, which is headquartered in Toronto and has a sister branch in Grenada. And she's a contributing author to three scholastic texts on child sexual abuse in the Caribbean. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dabro and now I imagine my fellow introducing partner, Dr. Jones, will take over the rest of the introduction. Dr. Jones. Thank you very much, Jonathan. My name's Adele Jones. I'm professor of social work at the University of Huddersfield in the UK and director of the uh, Global Non in Three Center for the Prevention of Gender Based Violence and, uh, and formerly a lecturer at UE St. Augustine. Uh, I've known Dr. Dabreo since 2008, uh, when together with Jacqueline Seeley Burke, she led the Grenada element of a six country UNICEF commission study of child sexual abuse in the Caribbean, for which I was director together with Ina trotman Jemmet. Since then, Hazel and I have collaborated on research projects, training courses, therapeutic okay. programs and publications. And indeed, as Jonathan mentioned, we co-authored a series of three published books on child sexual abuse, which remain the only scholarly texts on the topic in the region. Most recently, Hazel was Grenada country lead for new EU funded research, the Non in Three project, for preventing violence against women and children. Among the many accomplishments of the project, Hazel led the Grenada side of a survey of 1,400 children, which relieved alarming findings about the extent of children's exposure to violence and the impact this has on perceptions of what is normal. Most noteworthy for today's event was the finding that given the chance to report anonymously boys revealed greater levels of sexual victimization than had been previously understood or recognized. 
So yes, there is much here to contemplate. Hazel's contribution was also central to the creation of the first pro-social video game as an educational tool to change negative gender norms that contribute to violence against women and children. But Dr. Dabreo's work on violence against children predates our joint history. And anybody who follows the Sweetwater Foundation will see that it postdates it too. Tackling violence against women and children has long been Hazel's lifeblood. She is unrelenting. If there was an iconic figure for championing children's rights, as there is for civil rights, then Dr. Dabrio is our Ruby Bridges. Like Ruby, she has first associated with her name for many things, but none more important than for her latest work, child sexual abuse among the under fives. This program being rolled out by the Sweetwater Foundation is the first in the region. Indeed, I've, I've yet to find any program like it anywhere. Groundbreaking is such an overused term as to be rendered meaningless in many contexts. However, this work really does break new ground. By focusing on the darkest of human behaviors, Hazel illuminates what we all need to see. Sexual abuse among young children is such anathema to us all that it must be deeply buried. But do you know what level of complicity is needed to keep such horrors hidden? What strength of denial, what psychological acrobatics we must do to hide from such unpalatable truths and all to the detriment of the child? Hazel will recall in our 2008 study, the revelation by one of the participants of an 18 month old child with gonorrhea who was treated, discharged home and the matter brushed under the carpet. What this enormous failing of the health, protective and police services did was to consign this child to a lifetime of trauma while the adults around her developed collective social amnesia. Like Ruby, Hazel really has only one demand. The disregard of the rights of children must simply stop. But it takes real courage to be the one that takes the first step in showing the way, especially when there is a resistant populace. And Hazel is nothing if not courageous. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Hazel Dabriel. I feel as though we need to take a break now so I can just uh, breathe and take that in. Adele, thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Rhoda. Um, Adele, you know, they say you, you, you grow up to want to go to the Ivy League universities like Harvard and whatever they are, because that's where you meet your partnerships for life right? And I'm sure there was a plan somewhere for me to grow up to meet you and all our colleagues at Huddersfield because I've really learned a Harvard bunch through our work together. Thank you so much for everything. While, while someone is arranging that, I also wanted to remind um, Adele, do you remember when we were in Jamaica? What, maybe six years ago or so at a UNICEF annual conference, Heather Stewart brought us and it was on early childhood development. And uh, 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 an 11, 12 year old girl stood up to speak and she addressed this audience as bravely as 12 years old can possibly do. And she said, last year, you all came here and told us everything you were gonna do for children. 
And what I want to tell you one year later is you should have done better. Do you remember that? Great. The, the work with so the um, work at Sweetwater is really just to always continue to do what is necessary by children. This is, this is indeed our sole purpose here. So thank you again for having me. Um, Rhoda, I know you said keep the protocols short, but I really want to just make sure to mention my current partners in crime, crime uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Priya Maharaj. She is the director of research for the Sweetwater Foundation. And she has developed the bystander complicity model to which we'll refer later on. ResCap Media, they, um, the, they are the media directors and really um, uh, uh, put our campaign out in the public where it needs to be. Thanking Global Affairs Canada for financing for the Under Five project. The Ministry of Social Development for um, financing my sister's keeper. And finally, Dr. Gabrielle Hussein for doing all the um, IRB ethical approvals stuff for me, along with um, Trisha Basteo. Thank you so much for that. That's it, Rhoda. I'm done with protocol. <laughs> so under five, how did we miss the under five population, the unseen? Um, in, my, in my experience as a psychotherapist, now I had my first job in, uh, in the field of mental health when I was 19 years old. And so I've been working in the field for a very long time. And it always has been clear to me that adults, most ad adults, I don't have a percentage, but most adults presenting with significantly debilitating mental health conditions have trauma origins in early child sexual abuse. And most recently, all of these adults, I'm saying in my slide that it's in limited clinical research because I'm only speaking of the research that's known to me and not necessarily that is published, but all of them are reporting that somebody always knew. So how can it possibly be that with all of these years of all of us doing all this work to eliminate the suffering of children in all the various realms that we have just overlooked that under five population. And all you have to do is step into a room. We can't see it on Zoom, but if you step into a live um, audience and start start talking about the sexual abuse of children under five, everybody gets quiet, <clears throat> takes some step back. It's understandably a very, very difficult subject, and I'm not sure all of the reasons why, but it really makes everybody get immediately si silent, just at the thought of um, children in a five-year-old population being um, sexually abused. So under five is the current, um, I say current, it's really just beginning research project at Sweetwater Foundation. One of the things I'm very excited about in, in this project is that we're using a new um, research approach for me, it's new for me, it was suggested by um, Dr. Maharaj when I said to her, Priya, what, how should we do this? Um, I, I, have to, I have to say that um, between myself, Priya, and Ryan and Zanita, I like to observe, um, I like to hold the idea of freedom, creative freedom as, as primary in the way we deal, um, the way we work together. So while I, as the director of Sweetwater Foundation, have um, 
the duty of sign off. I rather like discussing ideas with Rescam and, and Priya and just leaving them alone. They are the ones that come up with all of the innovative ideas, which I then just administrate into um, existence. So gathering stories is a research approach I had not heard of before, but I think it very beautifully fits um, those of us who come from cultures that have the oral traditions in our background, because we love to talk. We love to tell stories. We want to sit around a, a fire or around the table or whatever it is, around a Zoom chat and talk forever about stories. So the gathering stories approach will simply ask, in, in the case of the under five research, will ask adults, um, wherever they are, to recount stories of under five abuse that they know of, have heard of, have witnessed, um, or perhaps experienced themselves. And the stories become the material, the data that is then analyzed through the usual scientific means. Um, and I think it's a wonderful way to collect feelings, reminiscences um, that's outside of the checker box, checker box, you know, the usual psychometric tool. So this is what we are in, in the process of doing. Um, and I wanted to say that in, it interests me greatly to do a research as well on researchers. If you can possibly think of researching the researcher, but I feel that researchers are uh, such a, a, a valuable resource, um, but I don't think we know enough about what the impact of being in close contact with the research subjects does with them. What, what does it do to a researcher who has to listen to stories um, from perpetrate, perpetrators of child abuse or listen to victims' stories or bystander stories? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be pursuing an arts-based research, arts-based research meaning, meaning that it will um, not illustrate the process, but, but look at the, what is happening inside of a researcher when they are put in such close proximity um, with, the most horrendous stories you can imagine, and perhaps without, without being psychologists or psychotherapists who would have been trained for that purpose. I'll get back to that later on. But arts-based research on researchers experience, preparation, and, and care for the, this kind of work is, is very important to us. Um, Global Affairs Canada gave us a three-year grant. The first year is all research, so it's unhurried and thorough. The second year, we will be looking for specific treatments that um, may be afforded to children in the under five population. Often I find that, you know, although from the psychoanalytic tradition, we have lots of access to play therapies and child-centered therapies, I'm finding that uh, in the Caribbean, we tend to use adult treatment approaches and just sort of overlay them on a child, but they don't work. And so a part of this, uh, of, of, of this process with under five is in our second year, really investigating child-centered practices that have been constructed for an under five demographic. I don't think there are a lot in the world. I think it may be up to us to do it, but we have to develop um, this kind of expertise. You know, the statistics say that 
the, the Caribbean has the highest rates of child sexual abuse in the world. Well, I think that the least we could do then is have the highest qualified healers of child sexual abuse in the world, because after all, to put it this way, we're the ones with the data, right? So we're the ones who should be developing the programs and, and, and we intend to do that. Um, and then finally, under the under five umbrella in the third year, we're going, we're going to see about taking all our findings um, and all the um, treatment approaches that we've gathered from um, expert professionals all over the world and turning it into a Caribbean model that we can then roll out because this is information that we need so desperately. Um, so now we know that we have an under five problem. We've always, well, recently come to be very clear about that. But now that we have had to suffer through um, COVID-19, other things have come to light as everyone has been saying. And one of the things that has come to light is the fact that for every child who has, I'm talking about Grenada, I guess, for every, every child that was sexually abused, this is limited clinical anecdotal information now, the child says somebody always knew. And I found that shocking. As much as we know, as much as we read and experience and research and publish about, it was again a new shocking thing to, to hear it said that somebody knew, somebody always knew. Here are two case studies quickly. There's a 19 year old female. If you look at her, she looks like 10, she's 19. And she has been trapped in a sexual relationship with her father all her life. At my point of meeting her, she hadn't got out of it yet. Um, but during the COVID lockdown, when you're there with your sisters and brothers, you know, in, in, in infinitely, you have no idea when you're gonna get out, the revelations come. And she told me that her younger sister revealed that she had always seen the abuse. She always knew. And this 19 year old client looked at her younger sister and said, what? You've known? How long have you known? And the younger sister said, I, I was about maybe four or five when I saw dad doing that to you and I've seen every night for the last 15 years. <clears throat> so this 19 year old client was left to say, well, why didn't you do something? Didn't you say something, do something? Why didn't you help me? If you've seen me go through this every night for 15 years since you were four or five years old. So these are some heart-rending things that come out um, because here again is proof that somebody always knew, but we're not of course now gonna go hard on the younger sister who first observed this when she was say five. She, how could she possibly know what to do about it? But as her older sister said to her, all right, then you were five. But after a while you were 10, after a while you were 14, you never knew how to help me. And we have destroyed sisterhoods. We have families that are, are broken down um, almost irreparably. So we are faced with the fact that not only are victims harmed, as someone said earlier, perhaps, throughout their lifespan, but everybody who witnessed or is involved somehow in, in touch 
in, in the atmosphere <clears throat> of child sexual abuse does not exit, exit that picture without a firm degree of, um, of harm, emotional harm themselves. So this is leading to why we picked up the bystander approach. And just quickly, another, another case study is a 64 year old female who also said um, that under the lockdown, she was in, she's with her husband and family uh, in the same house as her older husband, uh, sister, and, and her family. And she was moved to confess to her sister that I always knew as well. Same scenario. The sister says to her, what? Are you serious? Are you kidding me? You always knew? And she said, yes. I hid in the cupboard. I put my hand over my head and I said, oh God, oh God, when is this going to stop? But for whatever reason, she never could take an action of any kind to help her sister. And years passed. And that sisterhood is destroyed. They now live on opposite ends of the island. It's a small island, but believe me, one is in the north and one is in the south. And say to each other, don't let me pass you on the road. Don't let your children um, talk to my children. We done. It's, it's, a, it's a heartbreaking, it's a devastating, earth shattering situation for families to have to go through. And never mind the families, but you know, we, we ask each other questions like this in the Caribbean all the time. Why can't two women get along? Why are women at each other's throat all the time? Why do women prefer to have a male boss? These questions we ask and let it go. But I would really like to know why. And I'm hoping that uh, as a part of the research that we do with the next project, my sister's keeper, we can really investigate some answers and come up with some answers to the questions that plague the sisterhood and plague womankind for forever. Um, no longer good enough to say, well, women are like that, all girls are like that, but why? And if it's dysfunctional, we need to fix it. Too many years are passing and the statistics keep going up. So, um, Again, when I was speaking with Priya about all this, and I said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? She went away and she came back and she said, let's develop a bystander complicity model. So what that is, is, but first I, I, I want to say that um, it's not new in the world. I had heard of it before um, when I was getting to know about the Holocaust because Survivors of the Holocaust said, once they got to safety, they, they, they asked of Europe, how could you stand there and watch millions of Jews walk to their death and you did nothing? Well, it's a good question to ask. 1964, there was a famous case of a man who for half an hour beat, raped, and murdered a woman while 38 caring people stood around and watched. What is the bystander immobility about? For the girls group that um, Sweetwater Foundation is currently running, adolescent girls, they hold their primary virtue as, I know how to mind my own business. I know how to mind my own business, business they proudly say. And we, we need now to encourage our society to stop that and to begin to mind each other's business. But it seems so entrenched. So now we, 
know a lot about victims. And I have to take a moment to say that it's, it's really stunning to me the amount of work that we have done in understanding child sexual abuse and violence against women over the last decade, 15 years or so. Especially the amount of legislative reform that we've had. It's really, it's, it's stunning. And I do think that we lead the world in the advancements that we've made in that respect. But we know a lot about victims and we know quite a bit of, about perpetrators and, and you know, how they, how they commit their, their crimes, but we don't know a whole lot about bystanders. We don't know a whole lot about why you stand by and watch or know or have heard that a child is being tortured by sexual violence and you do nothing. I feel that we need to understand those choices so that we can um, offer better choices, healthier choices. And when, when I was um, discussing with this with Priya, we said, gosh, every time the, the topic sort of comes up in, in a public realm, and we start speaking about, particularly in the, in the under five population, because who is to witness? Who is to know? It's the people who live in the home, right? Um, they're not adolescents at school and playing soccer and so on. They're under five, they're in someone's home. They're in their home. So it means that we're beginning to say, mom, didn't you know? So unfortunately, um, we've, we've already done some research with this with Professor Jones, Jones, Jamad, Priya as well, and I, and in the six islands of the Caribbean that we did that um, study on, it was discovered that along with the very powerful woman that we do have here, along with the um, hard working, women that we have here, we also have women that were complicit, that are complicit with the sexual abuse of their children. And it's difficult to take that up vigorously because we are also about um, decolonizing the, the patriarchy and getting rid of violence against women and giving women a voice and holding up the goddess. But as Priya said to me, we need to take a bold step forward and say, what about the children? What about the children? They need to be our unforgiving focus. So this is the birth of the bystander complicity model that we're speaking about. Just to discuss some statistics quickly, um, Adele and team, what am I, I just have to read this. Yes, said that. Too many women as well as men with children under the age of 16, disclose that they believe that intergenerational sex, incest, was acceptable and that indeed it is prevalent throughout the society. So, the, so this we've actually known. In 2017, Paho said that it's 58% of girls in Latin America and the Caribbean that are sexually abused. I had been going on the, um, on the statistic that says um, one in every two Caribbean girls receives their sexual initiation by force. And I think that was a World Health Organization statistic out of 2003, if I remember correctly. But Pahu is saying it's 58%. 
So we're going up. And out of Colombia, Colombia says that only 50% of children who are abused reveal their abuse to somebody, anybody. So all of these troubling statistics that we have are, are possibly low. Colombia says, and of the 50% of children who are abused that reveal it to someone, only 50% of those report the abuse to an authority and it's the authority that collects the data. And only 5% of those proceed to legal recourse. So the implication is that <clears throat> if you go through, if you go through courtroom documents to get courthouse statistics, you're potentially only picking up 5% of what is actually there. So just a quick um, discussion of what the bystander complicity model looks like. Um, I'm not going to go very much into the model because Priya uh, and I are publishing on it next month. And there she'll show you her, her, mod, her scientific model. But because I have just spoken about um, what's going on in the home, and as much as we want to uphold the basic human rights of all, oh, you remember that video that um, Rhoda showed at the beginning from Sweetwater Foundation? It was a perpetrator calling on the phone for help saying he can't seem to stop looking at um, uh, prepubescent girls, which is the definition of pedophile. So we are prepared to deal with all people involved in child abuse, the victims, the, the perpetrators, and so on. Um, and we don't want it, I would not like it to be thought that we're approaching this with a sort of vigilanteism on a high horse riding in, trying to heroically save people. But no, we are speaking about changing the society. We are speaking about transformational change in the way people conceive um, um, right from wrong when it comes to the, the care of children so that we're not viewing um, being mobile as a bystander, as a single act of heroism, but rather as a variety, but as taking advantage of a variety of opportunities and situational factors. I'm sure that everybody in this audience can remember a time that somebody did something completely sexually inappropriate and if it was at a party, people sort of <laughs> laughed and had a drink and you don't know what to say. What, what we're saying is that all these little um, incidents of, of harassment and, and, and inappropriate comments create the, the, the environment of complicity. Um, and when a final act of abuse is committed, that final act is only the culmination of several opportunities lost to intervene along the way, perhaps for years along the way, right? So the aim is to create a safe community. Um, five steps towards taking action, just so you know, it's, it's, we're not talking about the one heroic act. You notice the event, you consider whether the situation calls for action, decide if you have a responsibility to take action because maybe you decide that you don't. Then you choose what form of assistance to use and you know how to implement the choice. So obviously, again, we're talking about um, training people how not to respond to um, a situation where you suspect that a wrong might occur with um, calling it out loudly in public or 
blaming, shaming, that's not at all the route that we're suggesting. We're suggesting that we need to get serious because we're not protecting children strongly enough. We're failing to protect children, particularly in the under five demographic. The rates seem to be increasing. So we need to buckle down. We need to get to it understand where all the gaps are. And perhaps through this um, bystander mobilization example, we can begin to make some transformational change in our homes and societies in general to better protect those little ones. Um, and here's something I like, I started this by talking about our um, research approach, gathering stories. And this is um, a suggestion by someone that we, we rarely hear stories of assault in which we mention someone who tried to intervene. And it's important to begin to tell survivor stories that include a friend or a family member who spoke up to change the course of events. You see what I mean? Um, I mean, we've, we've been brought up on Marvel comics and so on, and there's Superman and Wonder Woman, and it's Jesus Christ. Um, usually one heroic figure that happens to fly into the scene, but we need everybody, everybody. And it could be a friend, a family member, anyone who just asks, are you all right there? So uh, a way of beginning that sort of underground um, sea change, the swell of differences in the way we tell our stories by simply asking, was there someone there who could help? Who else was in the picture might begin to let um, children understand that there ought to be somebody else in the, in the picture, or maybe I could get in the picture of somebody else's story. You know what I mean? It's just one of the little things that is very, very possible to do. Um, I won't get into this. I think we already know the severity of the impact of sexual abuse on adults. Um, look at that cost, 93 billion US dollars a year was what the John Hopkins University um, published in, 2000, in 2015, the cost associated with healthcare of child abuse victims, child sexual abuse victims. We don't have any kind of data like that in the Caribbean. But if we're the ones with the highest statistics in the world, how much are we spending that we haven't even begun to calculate? And as feminists, um, Gabrielle, are you listening? We have to write it into our budget to look after children. Um, I'm almost done, or oh, I'm done. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Martin Luther King. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jill. This is really thought provoking and raises a number of issues for, that could really cause us to think and to reflect on our work in the past and our work in the future. Thank you very much to you and for the work of the Sweetwater Foundation in Grenada. And we wish you all the best in your continued work and hope that we can continue to collaborate. So I'd also like to acknowledge the contribution of Dr. March to this model. And uh, thank you very much for agreeing to speak with us this afternoon.